click, click. Yeah, there's a side. There we go. Um, let's see. Hopefully, you all have some paper and a pencil. So if you don't, or if you don't already have it out, get out a piece of paper and a pencil or pen, <clears throat> for you are going to be writing a few things down for me. Uh, this is a test on Philippians. Wait a minute, no, that couldn't be. We haven't even started the course yet, so. <clears throat> it's, so it's not a test, but I do need a pencil, a paper, a pen, something like that, <clears throat> because I'm not only the director of the Bible school and the founder but I am the pastor of the church, the senior pastor. <clears throat> and uh, before we begin, I mean, we've begun, but <clears throat> what I'd like to do is I would like, um, as your pastor, <clears throat> uh, we're going to write down some things, and then we're going to put them in this here little lock box. <clears throat> we're going to believe God for some things. <clears throat> so I'd like for you to jot down some things where you would like to see change. Change in your husband or in your wife or in your kids or in your parents <clears throat> or in your job situation or in your finances or jot down some things that we can <clears throat> pray over. Uh, and I can tell you right now, and you don't have to write it all out. What I'd like you to do is write it out enough where you will know what you're talking about, it doesn't, but it doesn't have to be full sentences or paragraphs. Nobody's going to see this. We're going to fold them up, and we're going to stick them in there and lock it. <clears throat> and then towards the end of the class, we're going to pull them out and see if the Lord's done some things. So nobody will see it. Not, you know, you'll be the only one to see it, but that's why you need to put your name on it and probably on if we ended up because this is a pretty small box if you end up folding it up small where you know it'd be small and you could see your name on the outside so we don't have to open it up to see anything when we pass them back out <clears throat> but i am sure that there are areas that uh, it could be in relationship to the church it could be in relationship to uh, me it could be in relationship to any area where you would like to see change um, and you'd like to see the Lord do something you'd like to see the Lord glorified <clears throat> but it needs to be specific enough where you will know when we reopen them you'll remember oh yeah that's what that was but not but it but doesn't have to be specific in the sense of you know that it's full sentences or paragraphs per se. <laughs> So, you know, if you're like wanting a boyfriend. <laughs> uh, you know, that's handsome and has money and a, ne a neat car. <clears throat> um, this can also <clears throat> include things for yourself. I mean, if you're wanting to see the Lord do a certain work in you, um, something like that, <clears throat> it really doesn't matter. Uh, it can be, it, it, and because nobody else is going to see this, you don't have to make it all spiritual. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You don't have to put it on such a level that, you know, I mean, if, if you just really would like a, Ford Mustang and put it down. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> However, I'm really hoping uh, for some things where we can actually see the Lord move and do some things. <clears throat> this can be family members, brothers, sisters. This can be just about any area. 
the Bible school, my breath. <clears throat> and it's okay for all this stuff to keep rolling because this is, this is important. This is a big part of it. <clears throat> now, if you, uh, so, you know, it's kind of like, in a sense, it's like taking a test. If you've ever taken a test where, you know, once you finished, you brought your test to the teacher and you're still sitting there going, oh my God, they can't already be through. <laughs> Anybody ever experienced that? You're just going, you're kidding me. My God, I just got the first question done. <clears throat> but if you are one of those that have already finished, you, you feel good about what you've written down, you want to bring it up here, make sure your name is on the outside where it can be seen and stick it in this here little box. <clears throat> and I promise you this box will be under my care and will be locked and I will not look at anything there. And once we leave here, it will be kept private. However, if anybody's like wanting to put like big donations, they can do that. <laughs> Smush them down a little bit there. <clears throat> and let me just say this for the tape and for the video. <clears throat> If you are somebody in this church or the Bible school or, and this isn't just Bible school people, this is anybody <clears throat> that's part of this church or fellowship, uh, if you're not here right now and you're listening to this later, uh, I would very much like it if you would do the same thing and I'll keep this, in fact, I'll put this thing in my office locked. Um, for a little while so that if other people who are not here, we do have some people out of town because of a funeral and some other situations. Uh, and that does include the people in that back room back there. Um, I would like for everyone as much as possible to participate um, because I believe that the Lord wants to do something. Amen? Take your time. I think this is important. We don't really have to worry a whole lot. I, how, I will, however, maybe my wife or somebody can also remind me uh, next class to pull this out and to make sure that everybody that's attending the class does this also so that um, we can see the Lord move for everybody, Lord willing. I could have just passed the offering plate, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Slip it in there one way or another. I think that's basically everyone in the room here, right? Have we got anybody left? Okay, I've got a couple more, or at least one more. <clears throat> the rest of you, if you would please, just begin reading the first chapter of Philippians, just taking a close look. And I would say, um, well, before I say that, um, Shay, are we going to be in fairly good position to ask questions and to get that recorded or no? Yes. Okay. Then if we do, <clears throat> I'll make it real simple. I'd like for you to look real closely at verse 1 <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and then I'm going to ask 
for a show of hands on why Paul started with verse 1. Okay, so take a few minutes, look over it, see if you can get something from the Lord pertaining to Philippians 1.1. And Deb, while we're waiting, would you also do me a favor and just go back in that little room back there and check and see if they're going to do this or have and I didn't see it or something like that. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Thank you, ma'am. Deb, can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Before we start asking questions, I am locking the box. Some of you may not know me well enough. I don't need a lock to keep a secret or to not be nosy. Yeah, yeah. It is. Well, it won't be when I leave. I don't know if they're going to come forward and have something else. <clears throat> And, and I will say this, in the, in the course of particularly the next couple of weeks, um, if the Lord quickens something else to you that you went, oh man, I forgot that, <laughs> uh, jot it down and then we'll have another go at it, okay? All right, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. let's begin. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. All right. Why did um, Paul write verse 1? Anybody have an idea? Scott? Well, um, he's, ident he's identifying himself and Timothy with what, what he's going to talk about later on as far as Christ being a bondservant. Um, saying that they are of that same spirit. Well, that's pretty powerful. <clears throat> However, you sort of have to know the book of Philippians to realize that Philippians 1.1 1, 1 and Philippians 2, 6 and 7 and 8 are, are not separate thoughts but that Philippians 2 is only going to develop what he's saying from the very beginning. Anybody else have a comment? <clears throat> yes. He's writing to the local church of the, of the believers, and so these are people that he already knows that have already believe the same thing he believes. Amen. He's writing to the local church, and they are those who believe what he believes. Yeah. One thing that is so interesting to me is these are probably people who are considered great in the eyes of other men, and they're calling themselves bond servants. So they're they're putting themselves in a lower place as an example too. So that's that looks important. I think that's really a good point. <clears throat> that that um, for sure Paul is an apostle. And Timothy is working with him, and they are putting themselves in a lower status in front of these people that really are lower, if you you know what I mean, lower than they are, and yet that's and and I think you went on to say that um, 
they're presenting a really good example to the other believers. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Greg, speak loud because I don't know how close. He's identifying him and Timothy with the ones he's writing to. And then I believe what he's doing is by, by doing this, he, he's, you know, he's equating them with them, with them with them. It's, you know, we're the same spirit, we're the same. So therefore what I'm going to present to you is important to hear, to listen to. It's not just a letter. Right. So there's an identification going on. And uh, and it's not just a letter, but it is a communication of something of the same spirit. I think that's what you basically said. Okay? Yes, Carol? One, one of the things that I just got out of it was that he's talking to all the saints and not just Timothy. Right. Good. So you could say that, um, uh, well, you, what you're saying is that he is including, he's not just writing to the leaders of this church, he's writing to the body also. And he feels that it's important and he feels like that everyone should be included in this just by virtue of being part of the body. Is that pretty much, yeah, I agree. I agree. Somebody else? Nothing else, huh? Yeah. And we'll deal with that. <clears throat> I don't... Um, yeah. Okay. Well, should I start calling people by name and not really I wouldn't do that all right um, um, the I wrote the the persons to whom Paul is writing are the saints at Philippi and to the bishops and deacons um, and then somebody mentioned oh oh uh, Jennifer mentioned this uh, interesting thing. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to, to all the saints in Christ at Philippi. So in a certain sense, although some, some people sort of disagree with this, you get the feeling that they are both, that these saints are both in and at. Okay, so, so where, what are they in? They're in Christ. Where are they at? Okay, Philippi. Philippi is a city, okay? That's why they're called the Philippians. They're from Philippi, which is the city uh, that he's writing to. And let's just consider this just for a moment. They are not only in... Christ, but they are at Philippi. Okay, I mean, I just think it's important to sort of consider the, let that soak in a little bit. And they're not only at Philippi, but they're in Christ. Okay? In Christ is a spiritual reality because God is spirit. Okay, you agree with that? God is spirit. But your consciousness really isn't in Christ. Your consciousness is here. Right? Okay. So you could, you know, you wouldn't say, but if you die at Philippi, you go to be in Christ, though. You couldn't say that, right? Right. Because we're already in, is what she said. And that's correct. 
So if you died at Philippi, you wouldn't go be in Christ. You are already in Christ. That's already a settled fact. That's a spiritual reality that is true in God, in Christ. Okay? But it still doesn't do away with this reality of being at Philippi because if you died at Philippi, while you would not go to be in Christ, you would no longer be at Philippi, would you? Unless this is just speaking strictly of your body. You see what I'm saying? All right. Those are just thoughts I want you to ponder on your own. And uh, there, are, there are reasons and... Uh, uh, for me to present things like that, they need to be meditated on and you need to settle certain things in your spirit because you will be taught all sorts of things. And you need to know for sure, not because I'm saying this, what I just said up here, you need to know the word and you need to know the Lord and the purpose for coming to a place like this is not to for me to instruct you into all truth, that's the Holy Spirit's job. The purpose is so that you might know the Lord and you might search the scripture and you might be steady. Yes, Amber? Um, I understand in my heart, but I can't explain what I'm saying, thinking, but um, the words in and at, are, aren't they very, very specific and very, very different in certain ways? They Isn't are. there a certain word for in that? Isn't it a different end than the, you know, American word for end? Yeah, yeah. Is that the kind of, um, where it's something very, very permanent in the meaning of the word? Well, certainly spiritually that reality because the permanency is, <clears throat> is settled forever as long as we abide in Christ. You know, that's, that's settled. That is, God's not going to change his mind on that. Yeah. And. Yeah. At, would that be like a side, or is that the same sort of word that we would use, like, we're in Texas today? Right. Yeah, you can say that, or because alongside has a good good uh, analogy to that, where it's, you're not in it, you know. Right, right, right. Well, I think that, no, I think there's some good thinking going on there, because in really does involve union but but we use that word all the time like i can say my car is in the garage but it's not in union with the garage right yeah um in one sense you could say it's at the garage but it's not really in the garage in the sense of union whereas um uh and, and you know you can you can join a a health club and go work out right but, you know, you, by joining, you really didn't become one with it, did you? You, you? you didn't become one. But when you join to Jesus, you become one the way a branch does to the vine. Okay? And so I, I like that kind of thinking because it helps us to, to, to move beyond that. I've, I've seen several hands. Let me see if I can get some of them. Greg? Well, it seems to me using the word in and at is being very specific and when he's addressing the end he's specifically or he's talking to a specific group of believers not just generally all believers right because not all believers are all Christ it's the difference between just being saved and being a son of God and then the specific the specification of being the location uh, it's he is talking particularly to these people this message and so you know it, it's like the way I think of it is like, if the Lord would give a word here uh, for us, it didn't necessarily apply to First Baptist, but it's still the Lord. But he's speaking to us here. That's, that's excellent. That's excellent because if you really, really grasp Paul's writing here, he, he's not like us. We're, we're just sort of Christians instead, instead of being... Uh, in Christ. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm talking in general. General Christianity is, is not really in Christ in their understanding or in their relationship. 
they are Christian. And so if they wrote a letter, they would say, dear brothers, or dear brothers and sisters. But they would not say, dear brothers and sisters, in union with Christ. And what Greg just said really was, was very good because he's saying, uh, by saying that, he is speaking to those who are of the same mind and of the same heart. And what is that heart? I love Jesus? No. Beyond I love Jesus. I am joined to Jesus. Christ is my life because a branch can't be joined to a vine and retain its own life. Because the whole point, listen to this, the whole point of grafting a branch into a vine is so that the life of the vine would fill the branch. And so Greg is saying the, this man, as he writes to this church, is full of the message, if you will. I, I thought that was a good way that he put it when he mentioned that because it, we know that it's Christ. We know that it's more than a message. But the message is part of their identification, isn't it? And, and it's certainly... It's certainly a huge part of Paul's identification, and he raised up this church. So, so when he writes, he's not going to go, dear brothers and sisters, how's it going? Still praying? Been reading the word lately? You know what I mean? All the junk that we do, man, he's, he's going to immediately hit them with the fact that, look, you may be at Philippi doing your thing for God. You may be busy in ministry at Philippi. But more important than that, and in fact, to all the saints in Christ who are at Philippi, he starts with the crux. He doesn't say, dear people at Philippi in Christ. Do you see the difference between what Paul wrote and what I just said? The difference is Paul didn't start with them where they're at. He started with them in union with Christ. That that's what You can leave Philippi. And change your identity as a citizen because, that, because Philippi was, was a colony of, the, of Rome. It was to, you know, Roman citizens lived there, which is different than a whole lot of other cities that, that are written to here. Um, and you could leave there and you could change your outward identity. You could change your ministry identity. You can change your involvements. But no matter where you go, if you abide in this reality as God says that is true, then you're always in Christ at, oh, you're no longer at Philippi. Dear Bob, in Christ at Ephesus now. You see what I'm saying? So what's the thing? What is the one abiding truth all the way through? It's union with Christ, and it is not something along a timeline that you're doing, that you're involved with, that you are finding an identification with, folks, our, our, our clear identity is not with what we do for God, or it shouldn't be. Can I get amen for that? It shouldn't be what we do for God. We shouldn't find value in what we do for God. Our value is Christ. Our value, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He's what we treasure. Union with him gives us all the resources of him, and those resources are him. Him as love, him as patience, him as all of these different things. What a treasure, because it's giving you stuff we don't have naturally, or we, don't, or we have on a good day but not on a bad day. We're, we're patient on a good day. Oh, yes. But on a bad day, it's like, uh, you know, what? You know, we start going through all this kind of stuff. That's because our identity is somewhere other than in union with Christ. And when we, when we have found that union, folks, everything starts lining up with it. It doesn't, if, if it's just a doctrine, nothing ultimately changes you know i give the example of change being you know the example of and i'll just use uh you know three things you know water ice and water vapor 
steam, water vapor, whatever, have, have you want to see it. Well, you know, one's a liquid, one's a solid, and one's a... Thank you. <clears throat> so it's different. No, it's not. Only the external is different. The makeup is exactly the same in whatever condition it's in. Right? So we say, we say, I'm changing. Oh, look, I'm changing. I'm not so hard and cold today. That'd be ice, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, but got a lot more gas. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you're more of a stinker today. No. The reality is, is that the change, folks, has to be the, 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 the uh, molecular makeup from us to Christ. Yeah, because ultimately there is no true change. I don't care, you know, I mean, you, you know, Israel was in Egypt and they were in the wilderness. And then remember in the book of Judges, they're in the promised land. You don't really see a lot of change in those fellas from those spots that I just described. Three different locations, and yet inside, they're still functioning off of the same thing. Well, there ain't no need going any further than to the saints in Christ. <laughs> you see what I mean? Oh, come on, get into the real meat of the book. Well, if that ain't meat enough for us, we got problems, folks. That's the answer right there. It is union with Christ. It is what God settled in Christ. Settled. Well, he settled. We talked about that before. <clears throat> so, did I, did I see another hand up over here? Uh, yes. I was just thinking the same as Spirit Christ, that when he's the maker, He's the molecular structure. There can be different manifestations, different outward. Well, anyway, I don't know if that's where you're going, but that's what I was thinking when you were talking about. That. Well, it's not. But uh, First Corinthians chapter 12, like particularly the first like eight verses really deal with that. Well, there are diversities of, you know, manifestation, but the same Lord. Or the, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administration, but the same Father. See? And, and what is it pointing out there? Well, here's what we get out of it. Well, the body, we can all function different. We can, you know, there's some sort of a freedom. To, oh, you, there's a diversity, so I don't have to just be like you. What are you, a Texan? You know, you don't, you don't want to be like everybody else. So, you know, oh, and that just makes me happy. Folks, there is something that's the same. It's Christ. It's the Father. It's the Spirit. It is God. God is of a different structure than we are. And so... You know, somebody said it early when we were talking about the differences. Um, he is writing to those that he assumes is of the same mind and of the same heart and of the same message and of the same desire. Because why would he address the rest of this book the way that he did? I mean, think about it. Unless from verse 1 on down, first 1 starts it off, and he says, I assume we're together in this. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Anybody, did I see another hand, or did we get too far away from your subject? All right. Um, I, I gave a couple of other reasons here. I said, what is the purpose for verse 1? Is it to honor the local leaders before the people and, and to respect their authority? <clears throat> All right. Um, I think that there's something to be said for people of authority, whether, you know, of another place or whatever, to respect the authority of the local church. And I think that was addressed, but, uh, but even more, for example, um, uh, many times I will be uh, called up and say, well, will you do a conference down here in Houston or Iowa or uh, uh, Virginia? Or I've got several on the, on the stove right now. Will you do these conferences? And I say, sure. 
And when I get there, I tell them, you are, if there's a pastor, I say, you are the pastor. I'm here to serve you. You are God's representative in this place. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a visitor. I am a servant to what God has called you to do in this local body, whatever that is. I don't try to take over. I, I am very careful about guidelines, uh, things like that, because I greatly respect their authority. And I think there's something to be said for respecting that authority before his own people. You know, I think there's something to be said about that. I think it's, there's something in the Lord of giving honor when honor is due. And it says that in the Word of God. <clears throat> All right. And then the second one, we sort of hit around this one, but uh, what is the purpose of verse 1? Is it to show that the body is the important thing and that they are just servants to it? Well, yeah, I think that's part of it, too that the apostle, that the prophet, that the evangelist, that the pastor, that the teacher are all God-given servants to his body. But see, here's, here's our American thinking, and it's so wrong. Well, you're an apostle, you're a prophet, you're an evangelist, you're a teacher, you're, you're someone great, and we're just the body of Christ. No, no, no. God says, you know, Jesus says, that's my body, that's me, that's my body, and you have been made servants to my body. Does that make sense? Because that's Jesus. Now, let's face it, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they are also members of his body, right? But don't don't mix up member of his body with uh, office. Because the office in every case is to serve him in terms of his body. That's the goal. That's the spirit behind it. And that's what it's about. Scott? Well, you know, I just think it's interesting because I was just flipping through the, the epistles. You're Philippians Brutus. Flipping, flipping through, flipping them. Uh, no, I was just flipping through the different uh, epistles and noticing that most of the time Paul identifies himself as an apostle. Yeah. And so, it, you know, I think there were three, you know, Romans, Philippians, and Titus, where he says sponsor. Which, right. Uh, you know, I just, it just made it even more significant to me that he use that in this particular person. Well, I saw that too. I mean, I saw, I, I thought, you know, I, I wondered if Paul was really that sharp. Uh, was this the Holy Spirit? But then I thought, no, I think it was a combination in the sense that Paul knew what the need was and he knew what he wanted to say and that was all orchestrated by the Holy Spirit but he stayed on task from beginning to end. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's kind of my view. You know, what do I know when it comes to stuff like that? But that's what I'm just, you know, that's what I'm saying. Um, all right, so what is the primary purpose? And here's what I believe is the primary purpose. Paul begins by identifying himself and Timothy to those whom he writes. Notice how he addresses the leaders and people as bishops, deacons, and saints, but sets himself and Timothy as servants. Now this is different than what we've been saying. It is going somewhere. With this, he implies that their relation to those at Philippi is to serve them. We've said that, but there's more to it. This is inc incredibly significant but the full significance cannot be fully grasped until we, we reach chapter 2. Um, I wrote it, suffices to say that in identifying themselves in this manner and the Philippians in the manner which he did, he has effectively 
exalted others and humbled himself. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you to take that out of the realm that we always put that. Take it out of the realm of, well, I'm just a servant, and any old servant would do that. but to put it in the same realm that Jesus was somebody and he came and humbled himself. That Paul was an apostle and he came and he humbled himself. And he did so because there was, I'll just put it on two levels. One is there is the reality that is Christ at work in him, the reality that is Christ. It is, it is first and foremost not an understanding of something. It is Christ and how Christ is. And is second of all, on the part of Paul when he wrote Philippians, was the beginning presentation of a pattern a pattern that identifies Christ crucified now let me say a few things before I go too far with that I I believe I must you know I'm going to struggle a little bit here but I'm going to just try my best to say it. I believe that there is no comprehension of Christ apart from Christ crucified. Okay. Let me so much to say along this line. I don't say that because I am a follower of the teaching of Christ and him crucified. I might have said that at some other time in my walk, but I say it now because I believe the Holy Spirit has shown me Jesus as Christ crucified. <clears throat> Now, I don't, I don't want to go too far right now, but we'll deal with this when we get to chapter 2. But when I say that, every one of us go to Calvary. We go to 2,000 years ago. We go to Mount Calvary. We go to a, two pieces of wood nailed together, and then Jesus nailed on it. And that's what we call Christ crucified. We, we have a hard time uh, laying hold Christ crucified being who Christ is. Not just related to an event 2,000 years ago. Yes? I was just thinking about that today. And it's like we focus on the act of yes. dying and miss the way in which he died. Amen. I've been Amen. chewing on that today. Well, that's... And I don't want to... I really don't want to go too far into this right now because... I, I need to get down the road with some things so that when I do, it'll have more impact. But I think you're really, really right. I think that there is, uh, I, I, my mind has done that. Our minds do that. Why? Because when we first meet Jesus, the Jesus we love was the one who died on two pieces of wood on a, on a hill called Mount Calvary. Amen? I mean, that's... That's the Jesus we know. We don't really know the one that hung on the cross in his being. You understand? We don't know him in his being. We don't know him. We just know what he did for us. And what he did is two pieces of wood on Mount Calvary. So when we go to Christ crucified, that's where we go. But that's, that's not the true fullness of who Jesus is. And that's what I believe this chap this book is going to help us to to understand. Yeah. Well, I 
I remember seeing passages that said something about he, the lamb slain from the foundation of the universe or the world, of the world or something like yeah. that. And also there's always pictures of the lamb, lamb slain. So it's been all throughout this time, not just on Calvary, that this picture has been shown to us over and over again. And that, that's what I've been thinking about after Mallory's class and stuff too, you know? You don't ever speak, brother, so. <laughs> yes, Scott. Well, you know, I was just thinking of kind of the flip side of that, you know, as far as looking at the act as opposed to the the source of that act, I guess. The, you know, and, um, you know, you could have somebody who, you know, some person who died for other people who was basically just a rotten person, you know, but they did that one thing right. Yeah. But, you know, in contrast, that that act was the manifestation of who he was. Yeah, and again, we want to get into this more later, but absolutely, I mean, uh, you know, uh, what Amber said also, if I can comment on that first, and that is, you know, she immediately went to scriptures that began to identify Jesus as the Lamb before there was a world. Therefore, before there was a Mount Calvary. Right? And to do that means you're stepping out of the realm of time and space. And you're saying, God, whatever that means, because we all, we've got that all figured out. Just God, just God is a good term for somebody that I really ought to know. <laughs> right? Open my eyes to know you, to see you. Okay? This is the heart that if, that if we don't go into Philippians with that, we're going we're gonna to miss stuff. And then what Scott was saying. And, um, well, let me, let me get into something here. Uh, and, again, this is going to be this verse 1, which is what we're talking about here, is, uh, I guess I could have left that is uh, just an introduction to, uh, I mean, like verse 1 is like a seed that if you water that baby, it breaks out into all of chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 and 4. I mean, it's just incredible. It's like it's all right there. If you were locked in prison with Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, the Holy Spirit could show you the eternal plan of God right here. It's just amazing. But anyway, um, so I'm going to read this last part again. Suffice it to say that in identifying themselves in this manner and, 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 <laughs> and in identifying the Philippians in the manner he did, he has effectively exalted others and humbled himself. And this is what I have, you know, I just make stuff up. But this is what I have called the coin. And you're going to hear of this a lot as we go on, particularly in the second and third chapter. The coin of God, the, the uh, uh, tender of God, the, the, the way that God uh, uh, relates um, and it relates to, well, let me just say, a, a coin is neither heads nor tails, but has two sides. So I just drew a coin on here, but, but in you know, this dimension, you can't see both sides. But it has two sides. It has a heads and it has a tails. It has, a, you could say, a positive and a negative. It has two sides. And if you only look at one side, if you're only one dimensional, you'll only look at one side and you'll never understand how it is that God functions in, in terms of value and things like that. Okay, so one side of the coin is, the two sides of the coin are, involve this, self-abasement and exaltation of others. Self-abasement, 
Paul and Timothy, servants. Exaltation of others, saints, bishops, deacons. You got it? Okay. No, you don't. But we'll... <laughs> Because I just introduced it, and it, it took me for a year and a half to even start getting this. But nonetheless, I have been praying for you and praying for this class and for those that would receive it, because I believe that there is an incredible reality that we're going to find in some of these things. All right. I'm just going to read a little paragraph here, because I just got noticed that I, I'm short. In these early verses, Paul does not mention Christ and him crucified. Now, I mean, we've read verse 1. You didn't hear Christ and him crucified, right? I mean, shouldn't you say Christ and him crucified, Christ and him crucified, Christ, shouldn't you? Well, Paul didn't feel the need to. In these early verses, Paul does not mention Christ and him crucified, but the results of it can be seen in how he presents himself. So what would you say to that? Is the message more important or, or the life? Verse 1 tells us. Verse 1 proves it. Verse 1 is a, a total declaration to everything that is coming. It's better to live it than to have all the terminology of it. Yes? The life is both a life and a message. That's correct. Yeah. A and it is, except for if you only get the message, you may never get the life. Yeah, you know, do you see how that's possible, that you would actually get the message of it and never have the life that produces all the things that the, the deal. But what, he, what Shea is saying is, the life really is the message that we're, we're you know, and this is the message. John said. Life, yes. Well, I mean, I see throughout the entire Bible there's this consistent line contrast, and the two contrasts are what is what is God's nature going to be, and which is what we should be um, identified in, and therefore God, you know, Jesus humbled himself, and he poured out into others, he was giving his life. Whereas on the other side of the contrast is men who have exalted themselves, like the Pharisees, who take this thing, take what, they were supposed to be the priests of God, and this is what I think what, what the Lord's really upset with them, uh, it wasn't so much that they committed sins as much as they were supposed to be this priest pouring out this life, but they turned it around and they some, made it something self-centered. Yes. And so, I think we've come full circle now, because what do you see? You know, you see in order to get the message out there, whatever the message is, you've got to have the spectacular ad campaign. You know, everybody's focused on the pastors or the church. You know, what the latest thing is. Doing. And but you really don't see a focus on Christ. You don't see a focus on humbling oneself. It's how high. You know, we've got to jump up, be up here, and you know, and we've got that, to see. And all that ad campaign is doing is. Self-exaltation. That, that's really what it is. Now we say, no, I'm doing this so that it's for Jesus. But, you know, we're not lifting him up. We're telling people, come to my church. We're not lifting him up. We're not saying, come to Jesus, per se. And I don't care what church you go to. We're not saying that. You don't ever hear that. It's, come to me, or, you know, I'm the pastor. Come to my church. Uh, that's why... Many of the churches that you pass by, when they have a sign out front, it has the pastor's name on it. Have you ever noticed that? You know, we don't have that because we don't have a sign. But no, 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 that's not. <laughs> 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 that's right. Yeah. Um, well, like the chalkboard, we don't want it having bullet holes in it. <laughs> All right, let me finish reading this. So um, in these early verses, Paul does not mention Christ and him crucified, but the results of it can be seen in how he presents himself. Later he, will, later, he will show the source and not the fruit. Think of chapter 2. Uh, but it does not matter to Paul, for he knows that all comes from Christ crucified. 
He knows it. He doesn't have to prove it to everybody. He doesn't have to talk everybody into it. He doesn't have to, the words aren't magical. Live it. Let Christ live, and he produces all of this stuff anyway. Therefore, let it be known that these attributes are not standalone attributes, but from Christ crucified. Notice not just Christ, but Christ crucified. And we'll get into more explanation of that also. However, he first sets them, first sets them forth, talking about the fruit, so that we might clearly see what specifically will be the end work of the crucified within us. I'm talking about Jesus, capital, the crucified. He's showing us the coin. He's showing the tender in which God uh, deals. He's showing us the uh, he's showing us the life. However, uh, he for, however, he first sets forth so that we might clearly see what specifically will be the end work of, of Christ crucified within us. Again, this will be addressed in greater detail in the second chapter of Philippians, but for now, I like my little phrase here. Let us mark its existence and ponder its meaning. Let's do that. Okay, that's good. All right, we're going to stop, take a break, and we'll come back.